Hello and welcome to DNQ Football back in our usual setup for our March podcast episode to discuss the winners and losers of the March International break. We're going to start in Europe, where of course we were during this international window, and then work round like a clock through Asia, OFC, Africa, and then finishing off with the CONCACAF region. First and foremost, Ryan, how are you doing? And did you enjoy the international break as a whole? I'm doing very well, my friend. Welcome. Everyone, back to DNQ. This is, does this feel, bleak's a bit of a harsh word, isn't it? But this feels far more like reality's hit now that we're on a record <laughs> back here versus when we were in the sunny hills of Cerro Valle, my friend. Mate, the international break was nothing short of sensational. And I know we, we say that, or at least it feels like we say that every time, but this one in particular was amazing, wasn't it? We had a amazing trip. I feel like it's a good place to start in Europe, actually, because mm. we can just scroll. Up. I mean, we've, we've put out a load of stuff about our trip to San Marino, a number of shorts. You whipped together uh, a wonderful vlog. I actually think um, I actually think it's probably our best ever video, if I'm being non-biased. Sorry, if I'm being completely biased. Sorry. Oh. Completely biased. Um, but could we, could we even maybe if you haven't already, have a little, have a little yeah, look at that. Sure. We do that. Yeah, you don't even um, need to stoop down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we had an amazing time. Let's. Should we talk about that in Europe before getting on to other stuff? Um, yeah. Where Where do we want to even start with that? Let's, let's Let's start exactly there. Let's start in San Marino, of course. As uh, As you just seen above Ryan there, the link to our travel vlog. I I would agree. I think it's our. Uh, one of our best ever videos that we've put out, definitely. Um, probably up there with some of the really cool interviews that we've done. Uh, of course, if you agree or violently disagree, then please feel free to comment. Uh, either way. Um, <laughs> oh, well, that's just, sweet algorithm, baby. It just helps us in the algorithm. Um, and if you haven't already, then like and subscribe. Um, let's start in, in San Marino. Um, yeah. A lot of hype built up, certainly in the UK and maybe online, um, mm. on Twitter and things, from... Even some mainstream media outlets I saw, you know, backing San Marino, trying to sort of end this nearly, at the time, nearly 20-year um, winless run. I keep almost wanting to say unbeaten run. It's the complete opposite of that. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a run without yeah. a win, which is now, because they don't play their next game until June, it will be over 20 years, the longest winless run in Europe of a national team. I don't, I'd be surprised if a club team beats it. Um, but again, let me know. In the it's, it's, it's the longest run with a win in international football history, isn't it? I would be really interested to actually see if there is in any sport a longer winless run. Yes, that's a good question. That's a better question. If if you know, if anyone is listening to this and knows of something similar um, in another sport, then please, there, there will be, there will be some amazing sporting stories similar to this. Um across the sporting world. So if you know of a case that is borderline semi-similar to what we're witnessing at the moment with, with San Marino on the football field, then please do throw a comment down there. Now, didn't the sweeper throw out something really interesting about a non-FIFA? Oh, was it all? Oh, I can't remember. Um, it was about Alderney or something. There was like a, a cup game and they've not won it since like 1930 or something. Can you remember those tweets? I've definitely... Yeah, they were talking about the Channel Islands um, yeah, sort yeah, of yeah, like yeah, yeah. competition that's held and it always ends up with Jersey and Guernsey, I think, as the uh, as the final. But, but I don't know is, if they play yeah. any other games. No, no, no. Um, but there is a team. There is a team um, that haven't won in that for an enormous, an enormous amount of time. Um, I can't find it, but I'm sure someone in the comments will will correct us. Yeah, no, no, I know. Um, but anyway, no, we were there. We went out there for the first game, as everyone probably knows. But if you don't, we will just do a blitz of a recap. We went out there for the first game. We were joined by some. Really, really brilliant people. Um, Paul Watson from the Sweeper, as I'm sure you are all aware of, he was joined with his um, by his brother Mark. We um, spent some time with Ellis Platten. We spent some time with the Tim Traveller. All wonderful human beings, and we were extremely grateful to share that experience with them. A few other um, other people as well. Um, but if you're watching, you know who you are, and we had a brilliant time spending that evening uh, and experience with you. Also, thank you so much. Um, the conversation before the game, it was in a joint consensus of 
oh my goodness, please, please just don't make this nil-nil tonight. Please yeah. don't make, make this a yeah. stinky, rubbish game and then don't go and then win the game on Sunday when none of us are here. Now, the, from a results side of things, they actually did better on the Sunday, but we went to the better game. We were there. We saw them lose 3-1. We saw them take the lead. We were like, oh my God, we're going to be here for the moment. They That was very, very swiftly taken away. And then the second half, after Pani Yutu's goal to make it 3-1 to St. Kitts and Evis was a little bit dry. However, we then watched, you watched, we weren't together were we for the, um, we the second yeah. game, but I, we be, did both watch it. St. Kitts and Nevis actually streamed it live on their Facebook, um, which I don't think they were probably allowed to do, but that's how I watched it. And that was a very, very dull nil-nil. Um, I think St. Um, San Marino probably should have won the game, really, the chance they had in the first half. But worth caveating for those that don't know, St. Kitts and Nevis made three very, very important um, changes to their lineup for that second game. No Tyrese Shade, who was man of the match in the first game, the left winger. The centre back Burley, who plays for Oxford City in the UK, is a very, very um, solid central defender. He was their most capped player going into that game. He um, didn't play in the second game. And then there was one other change. It was in midfield um, where Kyle Kelly, the really, really young um, Liverpool under 18, started and played quite well. But they, they dropped someone from midfield who gave them some strength through the middle. Yeah. I cannot remember who that was. Soul. It was the it other wasn't guy. It was Somersault, yeah. Can't but remember. they did they had they had they did drop. So they were playing a a significantly weaker team in that second leg, um St. Kitts and, and Nevis and San Marino still couldn't get the win. Um now, mate, that leads on is, uh, just quickly, is there anything else you want to throw out there about that that San Marino trip before we move on to the the rest of Europe and the world beyond? Not particularly. No, not not that we haven't covered already. Yeah, I mean, in, incredible. I think that, you know, it does beg the question, will they ever win, as we said at the end of our vlog? Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think that there was a lot of hype around it. Oh, will they win this game? And St. Kitts in the first game showed that they were probably, you know, at, at full strength or whatever that first um, 11 was that they put out in mm. the first game. They are definitely a, a stronger side. Than, yeah. than San Marino and if if San Marino in that second game can not dominate but deserve to win like they did and then still still not be able to score and they still came away with the draw they still haven't won clean it does sheet, beg the question will it ever happen yeah another clean sheet great oh, tough 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 but of course that does kind of move us on in a way to uh, the Nations League yeah it does they play a couple of games in June, San Marino, as, as obviously some of the European teams do. Uh, most of the other teams will be at Euro uh, 2024, which we'll cover a little bit as well uh, on here, just talking about one team that didn't make it. But in terms of the Nations League, San Marino's group is now finalised. Um, they were always going to be playing against Liechtenstein, um, the side that they beat 20 years ago. Uh, but there was a vacant spot, and it was going to be Gibraltar or Lithuania that took that spot and it was down to a playoff between those two sides which was played in the March international break and it kind of went the way that you'd expect yeah 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 I mean Lithuania over the two legs came out on top and and avoided relegation in the relegation playoff didn't they so Gibraltar they, they beat Gibraltar 1-0 across both games 2-0 um sort of final score on on aggregate so that league mm -hmm. that league d group now looks has has that wonderful lineup of Gibraltar Liechtenstein and and San Marino um, and I was looking at the picture, obviously, because that then kicks off this September. Yeah. And San Marino host Liechtenstein in Serra Valle again, don't they? Which will mm -hmm. will be probably. Oh, no, no, because I think they've got some friend, they've got some friendlies in the summer. I was going to say that could well be their first home game since ticking since ticking over the twenty year mark, and, and what a fitting way that would be to to potentially break the duck. But that that kind of yeah, that that's. I've got an enormous eye on that one, mate. So, mm. um, firstly, I will say that, that Gibraltar are a very a, a solid outfit and they showed that across the two legs against Lithuania. I think, just going off your question, and now that we've had this group confirmed for Nations League, do you think San Marino get a win in that? Uh, so, it's, it's a really interesting point to make because after San Marino, the European national team with the longest winning run is, uh, winless run, sorry, huh. is Liechtenstein. Um, yeah. They have a 37-game winless run now themselves, which is quite a way behind San Marino's. Um, but, you know, we are talking about a side that is not not in good form. And 
I think that there's every chance to to get the promo back um, from this group, if I'm honest. I think, I think, yeah, that, I think so. Early shout. I yeah. that they have their, their best players available. Um, I think that Gibraltar are a good enough side to at least win their home games and, and maybe pick up a couple of points on the road and get promoted. And, and I do think that it's it's a perfect draw for San Marino. There's They do start it. If there is, if there is ever a perfect draw for San Marino, this is it. Um, they do start their Nations League campaign with, on paper, their easiest game because they are at home to Liechtenstein. Yeah. Uh, can, and... can I just say, can I just say, do you not think so? We're just hop back, hopping back to our visit to San Marino very quickly, mm. sorry. But they, because you've just teed it up there that they're going to start at home. It's it's worth sharing and people would have seen this on the TV, but the pitch at the Stadio Olimpica in San Marino is unbelievable. It's a carpet. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. We, we came away, so we came away tea didn't we and it was like why do they play on that why don't they make it as horrible a pitch as possible why don't they make the pitch an a complete leveler because San Marino don't knock the ball around they lump it they'll play oh, a few yeah. they, they played some long diags and they did they played some really nice rate especially in the first half of the game we saw out to that left hand side got to the byline a couple of times good crosses but they've got Nicola Nani up front who's a, who's a good player um and they've played long into him. He's a target man. He holds the ball up. He's not blessed with pace, but he's got a good first touch. He brings others into, into play. And then off that, they, they then compete for set pieces, don't they? Because that's how they yeah. they can't. Yeah. They, they're not very good at scoring from open play. So why? Why is the pitch immaculate? It is. It is. And I think with... So it's interesting. So I think... I was going to say, I'm, I'm not going to now start talking like Liechtenstein are a real passing team and that, that then favours them in that first game. But I, I, I think... I don't think I don't, I don't know if they're going to win, mate. I don't know if they're it's, ever going to win. But it's it's not a tough away day. I think is probably you know what you'd say. Like when, yeah, when teams yeah, yeah. like England go there, like their their ground and their stadium and the quality of pitch is probably better than some of the better teams in Europe, particularly more towards Eastern Europe, where England tend to and we're speaking about it obviously from an England perspective tend to have a bit of a tougher time with an away day. Um, out in you know places like Slovakia, Slovenia, it's not always a, a, a given that, that result away. You go to San Marino. Obviously, they're a lot worse at football than most of the teams that they play, and it is genuinely a stunning surface. It is real top top quality, and it's uh, yeah probably to their own detriment. I don't know. I feel optimistic ahead of September. I think September. I, I think they're going to beat Liechtenstein. Do you actually? I think that they're going to be Lichtenstein. No, no, no. That has got nil-nil written all over it. I'm just looking at Lichtenstein's results here. They drew 1-1 with Latvia, by the way, which is a good result. And then, yeah. they, lost, then they lost 4-0 to Faroes, 1-0 to Luxembourg, 2-0 to Portugal, 4-0 to Iceland, 2-0 to Bosnia. They lost 3-0 to Slovakia. They lost 2-1 to Bosnia and Herzegovina. I mean, they're not, they're, you know, they're not regular goal scorers. I think that screams nil-nil, man, in September. That screams nil-nil. If San Marino don't win, then you do have to start going, OK, they just need to play someone really at the 200 plus level internationally in a friendly. It was it was interesting, wasn't it? We were talking with with everyone there and it was like who after they went 3-1 down in the second half, there wasn't a huge amount, was there? So we were sort of talking amongst ourselves about all, everything football and then San Marino in particular, because we were there and the conversation was, well, who would who would they actually be? And we all were kind of confident that they would be probably a, an American Samoa or a Tonga. But that was the only one that we were all like, that would be a 100% San Marino win. And some other lower ranked teams from other regions, CONCACAF, that we're going to talk about a little bit later, we were, oh, they might win that. But it wasn't yeah. it wasn't a given, was it? Um, no, yeah, but that, it, it's great that, that that group has been confirmed. It's a, it's a great lineup, the, the Gibraltar, Liechtenstein and, and San Marino group. Gibraltar will be quite liking that i think they'll go straight back up but and then we have that amazing potential um grudge in, match yeah the the big yeah the 2004 um the winning tie can they can they bring that back again in 2024 amazing 20 years um let, let's move on just quick though i do want to talk through some throw some credit now they're they're ranked probably too high for us to regularly talk about but the 77th ranked georgia securing their first yep. ever qualification to a major international footballing tournament with a fantastic win over greece now they beat luxembourg luxembourg were there was a lot of coverage on Luxembourg and the rise mm -hmm. that, that they have seen across the international stage in the last 10-15 years and the fact that they have reached the, the playoffs and they've done very very well to do so in a tough group with Portugal and, and others in yeah. it yeah. Um, they 
uh, Georgia beat them 2-0. 2-0? It was 2-0, wasn't it? Uh, and then they beat uh, Greece on penalties. Yeah. Um, was it pens? It was pens. Sorry, yeah. I'm, I haven't got any notes on this. I'm kind of going off the top of my bonds. Um, which is incredible. Um, so massive, massive props, massive congratulations to them. Wales lost on penalties to Poland and Ukraine went through Michaela Mudrik. Um, what a bargain for Chelsea. £90 so million pounds and he's... Um, he send its country through to the uh, to the Euro. So yeah, uh, congratulations to them. Anything else on Europe, my friend, or are we bouncing? Let's let's bounce around. Like you say, you know the Euros, uh, which we're looking forward to uh, in a few months' time. Mm-hmm. So that'll be played in June. That's what's coming up next in Europe, uh, and then Nations League kicks off again in September. We will be doing some coverage of the Euros as we did for the World Cup. Stuff like uh, preview and who we think is going to win the tournament. But obviously not bucket loads because it is DNQ football. And let's stick to the lower regions of the FIFA World Rankings and let's move on to Asia, the enormous yeah. continent that it is. And Asia had a multitude of things going on. We're going to start by talking about um, FIFA World Cup qualification. Obviously the big ticket item there, round two. And also then touching on the FIFA series as a whole, um, most yeah. of which oh, were, were covered uh, in Asia, Sri Lanka and Saudi Arabia. And of course, there was uh, another one in Algeria as well. But let's start with talking about FIFA World Cup qualification yeah. um, across the multitude of groups, the nine groups multitude. that there were. It's just, mm. yeah, loving that. Loving the use of that word, multitude. How many times have I said it? Have I said it? Just well, twice in a multitude about six of seconds. times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. A multitude of times recently. Um, I think that the easiest place to start is Group A. Yeah. And we have to start with India. Yes. Well, it was match days three and four, wasn't it? And they played mm. the... And in some groups, there were almost um, double headers, weren't there? Yeah. It wasn't consistent. Yeah. It depends how the fixtures were spat out. Um, but India had, ahead of this break, their match days three and four were both against Afghanistan. So an an incredible opportunity to essentially secure the top two, one of the top yeah. two spots in Group A and secure their passage through to the third round of um, World Cup qualification and Asian Cup, right? Yeah, you get through. Top if you two, qualify, yeah. And you're into the uh, AFC Asian Cup as well. Yeah, that's right. Um, and you got to remember, this is an Afghanistan team that has gone through an incredibly challenging period with the now again you're gonna to have to correct me on this mate but corruption um within the fa that led allegations. to allegations of corruption sorry of corruption within it, which led to a massive player revolt yep. um, and, a, and boycott and the change of manager well and the manager left right so they've had a change of manager westwood's come in the, the squad that they've got together now is it's about 70 percent of them are new players 70 75 mm-hmm. percent of them are new players because of the the refusal to play um so they have to say that they are have been up against it would probably be being um particularly particularly sort of kind to to their situation now um going into that afghanistan hadn't claimed a single point in world cup in in the second round of, of world cup qualification after just scraping through the first round um first game nil nil second game in india um and Afghanistan came away with a 2-1 victory. Mm. I did not see that coming at all. And Igor Stimak, ex-West Ham centre-back, under enormous pressure. I think you'd have to say rightly so. I mean, like you say, you know, touching off on Afghanistan, you're in a group here with uh, Qatar, Kuwait, India, Afghanistan. Afghanistan started uh, this campaign with an 8-1 defeat to Qatar and then a yeah. 4-0 defeat to Kuwait. And look... Yeah. Um, Understandable given the circumstances. Qatar, although at the World Cup they were obviously one of the worst teams, still a pretty solid outfit. I still expect them to qualify overall potentially for this World Cup. They won. They won the Asian Cup, didn't they? They, Of course, yeah, they won the. uh, the They they are a very, they're a strong side in that continent, right? But you've just said there that Afghanistan they started with an eight-one defeat, then they lost to to Qatar, then they lost four-nil to Kuwait. Kuwait were beaten one-nil by India a week before they beat Afghanistan. So that's the the sort of level. Um, as like a com- if you're using Kuwait as a comparison between Afghanistan and India in this World Cup qualification campaign, yeah. this in this group so far, 
So for Afghanistan, Afghanistan to get a nil in the first game, that's a, that's a really solid result. But yeah. for India to take the lead, Sunil Chetri scoring his 94th international goal in on what was his 150th cap, the 39-year-old. So um, we're, we're talking sort of negatively about India here, but that's massive props oh. to an international goal-scoring legend, by the mm-hmm. way. Mm-hmm. Um, so he gave them the lead. And then two goals in the last 15 minutes saw the tie turn on its head. Are they going to sack Stimak, do you think? Well, this is the whole question. I believe that there is a meeting going on between sort of the heads of the uh, the Indian football FA equivalent, as it were. Um, I would be surprised if they don't. Um, look, we're talking. Or do you about... think they'll just play out? Do you think they'll just play out the remaining games in June of this group of qualification and then see see how they get on? Because they've got they play I Kuwait they again. Risk it. Kuwait now are in with a shot, by the way, because Kuwait. Oh, so Afghanistan. Played... Yeah, but Afghanistan and. India both play Qatar in one of the final two, whereas Kuwait yeah. just have two yeah, matches yeah. against yeah against India. So that's really so Group A. It just leaves it wide open, doesn't it? And I think that's completely the fault of of the Indian team there to not grab that opportunity. Look, I, I think that whether he sees out the rest of this tournament in June or not, and I'm nothing against the guy personally, but Stimak I think does have to go. Uh, I think that there's oh. all sorts of problems. Sorry, um, oh, sorry. Arsenal fan TV uh, have called. Uh, they want no, their I, I, back. You're talking about a, an association that, whilst it's, it may have its problems, and there isn't obviously the kind of grassroots level and and you know proper league structure all the way up in India. You are talking about a team that basically rigged the games that they would play so that they would leapfrog Lebanon. Come on, come on. You you stopped me with an allegedly. We can't start throwing out rig. They were sneaky with the Lebanon fixtures. They set up games against Lebanon to leapfrog them in the rankings. Yeah, they did, yeah. Which is a completely true statement. Yeah, the same yeah, no, games no. that were not sanctioned by FIFA through any tournament, they set up tournaments to leapfrog. Now, all right, they did still go and do it, by beating them, but they leapfrogged them, got inside the top 100 in the world, so they'd get a better draw. In our preview of this round, we described it as the draw of all draws. I know, I said that. You short, yeah. You've snipped that into a short, so there is a clip of me saying this is the draw of all draws for India. And so the I caption feel like... of that is, can India qualify for the world? <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. That's what hey, we, we try. We, like, help. we are not in any way a clickbaity couple, are we? A, a well, we try not duo. to be within reason, yeah, within reason, but that does now look quite clickbaity, doesn't it? After the last, I have to say, they should be beating them across two legs, man, across two games, man. Like, well, yeah, can look, India again, qualify? We, don't this, we don't mean this disrespectfully to <laughs> to Af- Afghanistan either, you know, it's, no, it's not course, meant in any other way other than the fact that India they've now dropped actually to 117 in the FIFA World Rankings. So really, they're dropping like a stone. Sorry. Did you hear my voice? Damn, damn. 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 I did not but, know yeah, that. They, they really are plummeting. And that's before this international break. Uh, and of course, Afghanistan, you know, I, I don't know off the top of my head where Afghanistan are, but, you know, sufficiently low enough in the rankings that that will hammer India even further in terms Hold of on, the FIFA I can World tell you, Rankings. I, can tell um, I believe it's around 170, but it might be higher. They are 158. 158, so a bit higher, right? So they are a bit higher. But that's still a a big difference. And and India, with a draw and a defeat there, will will drop even lower. And Mm. basically the trajectory that that the Indian national team is on, you know, if they don't, don't forget, if they don't get out of this group, if they don't come top two, that means they're not guaranteed, you know, AFC Asian Cup qualification. They then have to go through the other route of that. And I just think it, it really bucks the trend of what, a lot of people hoped would be kind of reaching a peak in Indian football. You know, the expanded World Cup, a real chance for them to be one of the fringe teams that maybe, maybe qualified, you know. Um, I agree. You still have your Japans, your South Koreas, your Irans, you you know, and and Australia, Saudi, you know, it's still a stacked region in terms of the top teams. But India were one of those teams before this tournament that you thought, okay, they're a fringe side, They've got a decent shout, and they and again, not disrespecting Afghanistan or Kuwait or even Qatar. This group, they should have no issues coming second in. And I do think that I understand the frustrations of the the Indian football fans, and I think that you know 
we're going to move on to talk about some of the other teams and 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 Vietnam who had a similar situation. They sacked their manager immediately um, mm. in this international break, and I would be surprised if Stimac um, does stay. And if he does yeah. stay, then um, I don't see him getting past June. No, wow, Stimac out. You heard it here from Tom first, um, India Fan TV. Do you wow. agree? Do you agree? Is <laughs> you the agree? question. Uh, just worth noting, they are. They're tied with Guinea Bissau as the biggest droppers in FIFA World Rankings this year. Um, Fifteen places that they've dropped already, which is which is interesting. Um, yeah. So sorry, actually, can we just move on quickly? You, know, you mentioned Vietnam there, but I do want to talk about another another double header quickly because mm. I think also Malaysia's international break yeah. was massively damaged by the double header that they had against sure. Oman. Um, they were shaping up. They had played 2-1-2 from their first um, two matches. Uh, they beat Kyrgyzstan in a thriller, 4-3 Huge. in November. They beat. They went away and got a solid result. Uh, well, they got a good result away at Chinese Taipei, 1-0 victory. And then it's, right, what can we do now? We're playing Oman. We're playing them home and away. Two 2-0 defeats, which have put them now on the back foot in qualification. Now they still can qualify. You've got Kyrgyzstan that have got nine points, Oman that have got nine points, Malaysia have got six, Chinese supply have lost the four games that they've played. So with two games to go, they play Kyrgyzstan and they play Chinese supply. So it's still all to play for. However, again, it's that a missed opportunity for a, for a team that had started well and would have had hopes to, across this break, potentially secure their spot in the third round of qualies, my friend. Do you know what I think is a really interesting point to make, though? is yes, of course, it's a missed opportunity based off of the perfect start, the dream start. Yeah. But I don't think it's too damaging to their chances of getting through. And the reason okay. why I say that is because they play Kyrgyzstan and Chinese Taipei. Kyrgyzstan, who are three points ahead of them, play Oman and Malaysia. And therefore, Kyrgyzstan, despite being currently top of the group, do... It's up to them. If Malaysia can, because you'd expect Malaysia to beat Chinese Taipei, who've played four, lost four, conceded 11 in that time, and only scored one in return. You would expect Malaysia to beat them. Uh, and then I think it basically, this group, whoever goes through second, will be decided, um, certainly in a large part, by that Kyrgyzstan Malaysia game. Now, they do need Oman to do them a favour, of course. A draw in that game just really kind of hurts Malaysia's chances to come in top two, because then they'd have to beat Kyrgyzstan. But it's disappointing that they came away with two defeats, even just a draw to be chucked mm -hmm. in there so they'd be on level points with Oman going into the the final sort of month, as it were, in November. June. Of course. Sorry, June. Oh, yeah, they, they played in June the rest of this tournament. The next round starts um, in September, I think, actually. Um, I don't know where I got November from. But, uh, yeah, it does hurt their chances. Of course it does. But they've just got to beat Kyrgyzstan and then they've got a real good chance of going through still. Or not lose. Um... Hey, I don't know. But I, yeah, I just feel for me yeah. because I thought, again, we didn't do... Did we do a video? Can Malaysia... Will Malaysia qualify? <laughs> no. Yeah, but I think that we were a lot more reserved with that. Okay, all right, fine. I'm, feel, I'm just know. feeling conscious of the content, man. I thought we knew ball in this region. I think we no, still think, do a little bit, man. Yeah, I think the tough thing about this group from a Malaysia perspective is... Um, and I suppose, you know, you could apply it to a lot of groups, but but Team 4 in, in Chinese Taipei, whilst they're not complete pushovers in the Minnow Nation world, that they aren't really putting up much of a fight against the other teams. Um, yeah. So everyone's guaranteed at least six points. Uh, not guaranteed, but it's highly likely that everyone's going to get six points. They're not, they're they're not, not sort being of taking out. points off. They're not taking points off, are they? No. no. We'll see. We will see with Malaysia. Now, can we go to Vietnam? Because I don't think... I didn't know about the manager being sacked, mate. What, he got so sacked he was. immediately after the second game. So talk us through that then. Well, Indonesia are a side that we've tracked for a little bit of a while um, now because we quite like the way that they play. I'm a big fan of uh, Shin Tae Yong, who's their manager, and the way that he's got them set up. They played against Curaçao a little while ago and beat them. They played against Argentina, and it was a close game. And they're just really sort of going from strength to strength as one of these ASEAN teams. They've also um, tapped into players that are eligible to play for them, so players like Jordi Amat, um, Elkin Bagger as well, you know, players that can represent Indonesia and are now doing so. So they have a strong team. But going into this double header that they played, it was a little bit like a shootout for for who basically was going through. And if you look at um, Vietnam's results in match day one and 
two uh, of this sort of World Cup qualification second round. Um, beat the Philippines 2-0, which was a really yeah. good start. And then they only lost to Iraq in the last sort of the 97th minute. Yeah. So that was un- that was an unlucky defeat. So uh, Indonesia at the same breath, they'd drawn with the Philippines yeah. and lost 5-1 to Iraq. So they exactly. were coming into this in, in completely different forms. And this was a real opportunity for Vietnam to take take qualification by the scruff of the neck by getting four points out of two against um, against Indonesia. But they lost both, mate. I, yeah, and I mean, you know, really it's even worse. Phil- Philippines, obviously, they had a double legger against Iraq and, and semi unsurprisingly due to the strength of, of Iraq, lost both. So they're now out and Iraq are, are, are through. And I think a lot of people were expecting, maybe not the same, but certainly similar from a Vietnam-Indonesia perspective. You've got to think, even if, even if Vietnam had won one of those games and lost the other, they'd still be, they'd be two points clear. Um, going into the the final qualification match days of Indonesia, they lost both, and now they're in a position where they're four points behind um, in Indonesia go. with with those two games to go. And of course, Indonesia will hope to do a little bit better when they play against the Philippines on the final match day. They do play Iraq first, but it will be huge because you know if you assume, mm-hmm. which you can never do in international football, that. Um, Philippines unfortunately lose to Vietnam. There will just be a point between the two teams, but Vietnam will have to play Iraq and Indonesia will play Philippines. So from an Indo- uh, from a Vietnam perspective, and don't forget how well they did last time for getting through to round three and, and mm. really challenging there in World Cup qualification. They've seemingly taken a huge backward step against another ASEAN side who they play and beat quite a lot yeah. in, uh, in sort of Mitsubishi Electric Cups. And the manager immediately sacked for Vietnam. So an yeah. awful, awful international break for them. Really, 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 really challenging. I want to just touch on a couple of others, mate, just before we move on. I'm aware of, of the time that we're spending on this. So um, really rough um, couple of weeks for Pakistan with some heavy, heavy defeats. 7-0 cool. away at Jordan and a 3-0 home defeat to Jordan. The um, the first game, they recovered well after being two down inside 10 minutes. Um, only lost that one 3-0. The away game, 7-0 is particularly tough, I'm sure. Their manager, Constantine, will be would have been pretty displeased with that one. They will hope for, for better doesn't get much easier for them though they play Saudi Arabia at home in Islamabad which I'm sure will be an amazing atmosphere so let's hope that they can pull off something quite sensational or at least enjoy that moment for what it is which is a huge game against a a really really strong footballing nation Uh, and then they are away um, to to Tajikistan to um, round out their final what will be their final match of World Cup qualification they've done really really well to get there Um, so let's hope the last two games they can um, go out with a little bit of strength shown, and then my last one, mate, is just just a quick touch on the the Palestine um, performances so far. Um, they beat Bangladesh five nil. That was an incredibly impressive victory, and then a one nil victory away. They played Bangladesh across a double header. They beat them five nil at home, and then one nil away. Um, of course, when we say at home, they are playing Kuwait at the moment um, for the issues that, that everyone seems to know about. So. Um, the, the circumstances and, and the backdrop to their World Cup qualification campaign is, um, yeah, uh, something that everyone knows about. So we're not going to divulge, but um, an, a really, really impressive two victories for them against uh, Bangladesh, which with two matches to go, leaves them five clear of Lebanon uh, in Group I. So it looks likely that they will make it through to the third round of World Cup qualification. Um Mate, where do we want to move on to now? Do we want to quickly touch on Oceania? Wasn't an enormous amount. Some friendlies um, amongst the likes of Fiji and the Solomon Islands. The main bit of chat was OFC Nations Cup qualification, which kind of went the way that we thought it would. Yeah, so um, like you say, a couple of friendlies are between Fiji and the Solomon Islands, which is always great to see that they're playing each other a little bit more. But the main sort of the big ticket item for the March International break was the OFC Nations Cup qualification uh, group. Uh, yeah. which just consisted of uh, three teams in this one. Um, American Samoa are not taking part uh, in the qualification. Uh, Do we know held... No. Didn't fancy it. No, didn't fancy it. Uh, maybe off the back of their heavy defeats. Absolute they probably pummeling. decided it yeah. Yeah, in, the, in the Pacific Games. Maybe they decided it wasn't the best shout. Uh, but we it was hosted in Tonga, which again was great to see. Let's not forget that the last uh, lot of World Cup qualifiers Tonga weren't able to participate in because of the natural disasters in the area. So great to see Tonga hosting a tournament uh, that consisted of themselves, Cook Islands and Samoa. Um, pre-tournament sort of predictions from a lot of people would have been 
in alignment with the way that it went. Um, Samoa, of course, did fantastically well at the Pacific Games and showed that they are a lot stronger than some of the other sides uh, further down there. Um, and Samoa went through. They they won their first two games. Uh, they beat uh, Tonga 4-1 and then the Cook Islands 1-0, which, again, is not a bad showing from either um, Cook Islands or Tonga, actually. No, I in, agree. In all due respect. Um and then Cook Islands played Tonga on the 26th of March, the final game. It did sadly mean nothing because qualification was already done with Samoa going through to the tournament played in June. But the Cook Islands did win that 1-0. And yes. we'll now look ahead, um, Con uh, Conga. Um, Cook Islands and Tonga. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Con I was trying to say both at the same time. And Conga Con will be a surprise yeah. entrance to the yeah. NFC Nations Cup. Yeah. Uh, so Samoa. We'll play, trying to combine all three. Samoa will play Nations Cup in June, uh, which we'll be covering. And of course, that will be absolutely fantastic. Yeah, we'll be Cook covering Islands that. We'll probably be covering Tonga. that more than we will the Euros, won't we? As a, as a major. Oh, definitely. Like, definitely. Yeah, it runs from the 15th of June to the 30th of June, I think, something yeah. around then. Um, and again, formats and how that tournament will work is, is a video that will come um, from us. We're absolutely. really looking forward to that. Um, hosted in Vanuatu, right? Yeah, this one. Yeah, we'll talk about yeah. that That's for another video. But hey. That's a whole yeah. other preview. Samoa, oh, yeah. we, we thought that they'd, after their really, really impressive Pacific Games showing uh, on the on the football field, we thought this was coming. Uh, actually, I thought that the scores would have been a bit bigger, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Um, they only beat the Cook Islands in the 88th minute, a, a fairly late winner there to win that 1-1-0. So, and Tonga, I thought, did well with only a 4-1 yeah. defeat. And then only a 1-0 defeat to Cook yeah. Islands, by the way. Tonga, yeah. uh, good to see them back on the international stage playing football sure. and, and not getting... Um, a, not getting too much of a bruising. Uh, yeah, if that's yeah. the way to if that's the way to put it. And they play again in OFC World Cup qualification, which kicks off in September. And again, we'll be all over that. Like a rash. oh yes, again, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Videos to come and all of that. Um, so yes. if if yeah, if that doesn't compel you to like and subscribe this video, I, you know, I don't know what or will. will. Yeah, find a different channel. Well, oh, well. Okay. <laughs> wow, goodness me. Ask the AFTV. I've got troops on the line with me. <laughs> Shall we move on? Um, <laughs> going round the globe as we are to the continent of Africa and AFCON um, preliminary round double leggers took place in the March international break uh, on the yes, 20th sir. and 26th, or some games are on the 22nd and 26th of the month. The matchups Somalia, Eswatini. Djibouti, Liberia, Chad, Mauritius, and South Tome, et Principe, and South Sudan. Now, we did nice. our full preview video of that. Um, we got most of the we predickies right, didn't we? Barring a sensational Chad victory. I think we called yeah. the right, I, thought, I think we called the teams to go through, didn't we? We called Eswatini. We thought it'd be closer. 5 2, we were sort of there or thereabouts. I think that's probably, we were all right there. The first leg was. Yeah, three 0 to Eswatini, which was a wider mark than we that we, mm. that we guessed at the start. Uh, we thought South Sudan would go through. I didn't think that would go. I didn't think that would be an away goal situation. Think it would be as close, isn't that? One one in the first leg against STP, nil nil in the second leg, so they went through on away goals. Djibouti, a two 0 defeat to Liberia in the first game, nil nil, solid showing in the second leg. But they exit Liberia, go through to the um, the first round of Afcon qualification, and then Chad with a one nil and then a two one victory over Mauritius, a fantastic result for them. Um, they have yeah. sorry, go on, mate. Are we going to say something? I was just going to say, yeah, I think that we got all of them kind of right apart from that one which we we weren't 100 percent certain which way it was going to go but i think i backed mauritius in that chad even after the first game a one nil lead uh, they scored in the 93rd minute of that first game so it was a, a huge huge goal for them but then when they played against mauritius at half time it was one nil to mauritius making it one nil overall and no one going through on on away goals um and actually i've just picked up on something so Chad then scored to go 2-1 up, right? One all in the second game, 2-1 up. Right. They then scored again on the 90th minute, right? Okay. Last last kick of the game. It was. The goalie went forward, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. Why? Because Mauritius, even if they'd have scored, would have gone out on away goals. So why did the keeper go up? Because even if he'd have scored, 
they'd have gone hey, out. Might have been, hey, yeah, but there might have been another minute or so to play, and it's right. Okay, it's it's, it's just the last throw of the dice, isn't it? I guess. I guess so, but yeah, um, a, a brilliantly hilarious counter-attacking goal where the keeper almost almost gets to the the ball that was struck from just in, just sort of inside the Mauritius half. Yeah, um, and sees Chad through, and the celebrations on the streets of Chad. I don't know if you've seen any of those videos, fireworks and everything going off. Were Absolutely they? fantastic scenes. Yeah, it's, I was, it's sensational. Um, I was looking at sort of Chad's sort of Afcon qualification history. Uh, they've never obviously qualified for Afcon. You know, it'd be it would be in a god, wouldn't it? Being sensational. Oh, that would be incredible. Man. I mean, yeah. that would be unbelievable, wouldn't it? But in twenty twenty, so in twenty twenty three, they exited at the the preliminary stage, and then for the twenty twenty one tournament, they got through. Um, but they were disqualified because the government disbanded the Chad Football Association. So then CAF um, disqualified them from qualifying. And then for 2019, they were banned and they were banned for qualifying for 2019 because in 2017, they withdrew. They, so they've gone 2017, they withdrew. 2019, they were banned. 2021, they were disqualified. And then 2023, they didn't qualify. They went out in the prelims. So this will be the first time, This the 2025 AFCON qualification campaign will be the first time that Chad are, are giving a, are, are sort of having a proper AFCON qualification that's beyond the um, the preliminary round. The first time since 2012, where they yeah. um, played eight matches as part of their qualification campaign. But yeah, what a, yeah, a mad little bit of, um, of digging there. That, that... Yeah. And look, a phenomenal result for them. And they'll have to wait until... They haven't September. Drawn. They haven't drawn it yet, have they? No. It's not been drawn, no. And I've also not seen a date for the draw either. So, again, something will be all over. But, yeah, it's September is we know that that's when the first um, sort of formal qualification round takes place um, for yeah. AFCON 2025. But absolutely fantastic. Well, congratulations, obviously, to all the sides that have gone through, but particularly um, to, to Chad in the fantastic way that they did it, getting past Mauritius. Yes, Sen say Chanel. Now, actually, before we do anything else, do we want to touch on FIFA Series stuff quickly? I think people yeah. spoke about it quite a lot. There was a lot of chat around it. The access to those games was brilliant, by the way. Worth worth throwing that out there. FIFA Plus was pretty decent, wasn't it? You sign up, watch the games. We were watching them on your laptop in, in Italy. Yeah. Um, quality of the game's good. The fixtures to see these teams, to see some of these sides play against each other was brilliant. We watched that Guyana Cape Verde game was a very, very good game where I think Cape Verde for the first 10 minutes, yeah, just randomly going at this because we sat there and watched that whole game, didn't we? Cape Verde mm -hmm. were very impressive for the first 10 minutes, but Guyana got stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger and actually could have earned themselves a draw late on. Um, Quillian Roberts for Guyana in goal, by the way. Unbelievable. Oh, what a player. What a mm. player. Um, and um, was it Oh, God, sorry, man, I don't know. Was it Bhutan or, or Brunei that beat um, Vanuatu? Uh, that's such a good question. Um, it was Brunei, right? Uh, it was because Brunei, great Sri Lanka yeah. beat Bhutan. Yeah, looking at it now. Um, Hakimi with a 94th minute winner yeah. for Brunei. We do not condone gambling on this channel at all, but I, I did put five pound on brunei to win that which won me 45 pound so thank you skybet that basically paid for our night in san marino <laughs> uh, yeah um anything else on the fever series do we want to talk about it some cool games some some good wins um i actually uh, anyone any actually... particular do you want to talk about any any players any teams what do you want to do sorry man i do i, I want to shout out a couple of players obviously uh, dylan de silva star boy in Sri Lanka. We've been to see him play uh, in conference south for Torquay. He no longer plays, he plays for Wellstone. He's doing well there, which is great to see uh, going out. The tournament held in Sri Lanka, which yes. was, you know, you had a couple in Saudi, which is really kind of established as a place where you can play lots of football matches. And of course, they're, they're having the World Cup in about 10 years time. Um, but Sri Lanka, who have only sort of recently had a few tournaments that they've um Hosted in, in Colombo, great to see them doing it. The crowds looked great and there was a real good atmosphere at those games. And congratulations to, to Dylan De Silva on uh, on scoring in that great win that they had. But a particular shout out that I want to give is to Amari Glasgow of the Guyana national football team, a player that we first came across in Nations League yeah. uh, in their group against uh, Montserrat and Bermuda and Haiti where he really stormed onto the scene and was was scoring some goals and, and really was a difference maker 
going forward. Uh, if you actually look at Guyana's all-time international top scorers, their highest ever is Nigel Codrington with 18 goals. Amari Glasgow, who's only been active in the international football scene since 2021, is just two goals behind that. He has 16 goals in 22 international caps, a ratio, if you will allow me, of 0.73 goals per game. Wow. And what a talent that is. Um, you know, Codrington did well as well. He only played 26 times. But broadly, if you look at the rest of the players, you know, you've got players like Treyon Bob scored 12, but that was in 51 caps. Mm. And Neil Dan scored 11 in 25 and players like that. But Amari Glasgow, just like Michael Richards, he's burst onto the scene. <laughs> And 16 in 22, including a brace in their win over Cambodia in this most recent FIFA series. He yeah. is definitely a starlet to watch out for in Nations League and World Cup qualifications that are coming up in the CONCACAF region. And I just yeah. wanted to give him a special shout out because I think that that, given the fact that he's only a few goals away from becoming his nation's all-time top scorer after potentially sort of less than 25 caps. Yeah. He's, he's only 20. Absolutely well. sensational. Yeah, 20 years old, 16 international goals. Incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he was um, he he played he was in the first half he was a little bit quieter wasn't he in that Cape Verde game that we watched but then yeah. he grew into the game more in the mm. second half very very talented player for Guyana and and will probably be a, a threat for them uh, on the international stage for many years to come. Um, Concacaf mate, of course, our final destination on this worldwide tour. And, what a trip uh, it's what a trip it's been. Oh, I need to sit down, take a breath. We've crossed multiple time zones on this podcast. Hope you've enjoyed it so far. If you're still with us, then I'm sure you subscribe already. But if you don't, then please do. Please like. Um, it all helps us out. And leave a comment as well if you are enjoying it. And we'll slice and dice this up across various different clips and stuff as well. So uh, if you do see any repeated content, do you think, just watch uh, that yeah. and like it again. Yeah, please do. Please do. Do you think at this point, because I'm looking at the recording, right, and we're 48 minutes in, how many... Yeah. When we look at the stats and facts and figures, how what percentage of audience will still be watching at this point? Less than ten percent, probably. But what I will say is, you probably get to a point where, um, after sort of half an hour, people who are still watching then are still watching at forty-five. Yeah. You know, and we call those less. guys the D the DNQ diehards. Yeah, DNQ diehards, the DNQ community. Um, oh, that's you know. sorry. Hold on, that's Thank good. You. Where did you come up with that? I think I've said it on every podcast episode and you've reacted exactly the same every time. Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh. I, don't, I don't think I've ever heard that before. Have you said that the before? DN, the DNQ community, yeah. Or maybe I've just thought you've said the DNQ community, but DNQ no. community, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Write that down. I think that's a short. <laughs> well, it has to be. <laughs> Oh. Anyway, uh, let's talk about Concord. Sorry, look at me uh, just looking like a seal. Yeah. Oh, oh fantastic. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, man. Let's let's talk Go about Concacaf. Yeah, World Cup qualifiers, round one. A couple of teams only getting two matches to make history. Um, you know, a lot of sides never got past this first stage. You had the Virgin Islands derby, U.S. versus British Virgin yeah. Islands, and you also had Anguilla versus Turks and Caicos Islands, the four lowest-ranked teams, all lower than 200th ranked in the world, but yeah. the four lowest-ranked teams in the CONCAP region going head-to-head -head, uh, like a playoff. Um, but they would, obviously, then two of the teams going through, home and away. So, no so away so goals like a, like a playoff first round, and then no <laughs> playoff final. Yeah. You know? Okay. Yeah. No away goals, which seemed weird. A few people asked me if there was away goals, and I kept going, yes. because feels weird in... that there was away goals in um, Africa, but Africa. not in the CONCACAF region. Yeah, and I looked Sorry. a few years ago. Sorry, yeah. yeah, it was. It was AFCON, so it no, wasn't it's World Cup qualifiers. But... No, 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 a completely different tournament. There does, it, does, it does now make sense, though, really. But Actually, yeah, does yeah, it? Yeah. Because when I looked, not for the last World Cup, so not for 2022, but in 2018 World Cup qualifiers, there were away goals in CONCACAF. Hmm. So it's obviously yeah. something they've they've got rid of, um, and both matches, both sort of yeah matchups, I should say, going to penalties. Which one would you like to speak about first? Should we just talk? Well, yeah, let's talk about them both before we go individually. Would you say they were slightly disappointing from a scoreline yeah. fixture? Yeah, massively, massively. Yeah. I will say, um, 
I know more about the Turks and Caicos Islands. And let's Aguila let's and start there then, because I feel like I feel like I know what you're going to say here. So let's start with that Turks and Caicos Islands versus Anguilla. Um, which before yeah. you start talking about Turks and Caicos, I just want to throw out there an incredible achievement for Anguilla for their first time in their history to get through to the second round of World Cup qualification. It's only the second time that they've not lost every single World Cup qualification game. Um, the only other time that they avoided defeat in a World Cup qualification campaign was in 2006. They drew one, they lost one, they exited the first round. They drew nil-nil with the Dominican Republic, quite incredibly. In the first leg in 2004, they then lost 6-0 in the second leg. Um, so they now, after the, the victory over Turks and Caicos Islands, and I, we'll, we'll talk about it in a bit more detail, they go into a group containing El Salvador, ranked 81st, Suriname, ranked 144, Puerto Rico, ranked 160, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines, ranked 173. An amazing achievement for the team, ranked 209th in the FIFA World Rankings, mate. I had to, before you, because I know what you're going to say, I had to throw that props out there first, because I know you stayed up till about 2 o'clock in the morning, TCA your team and they went out on penalties. Go ahead. I know what you're going to say. Well, let's, yeah, no. You, you we're talking about the score. We're talking about the score line, aren't we? We're talking yeah. about the score line and, and right. I knew where you were going to take that. Anguilla, as a national team, are not bad defensively. We've seen them improve a lot recently. Yeah. They, like, they've had a tough time in Nations League, right? And, you know, it is what it is. Again, against better teams, they do still concede lots of goals. But in teams of a similar ilk to them, they are solid defensively. They're not, you know, you can't break them down that easily. And they are a lot better defensively than the Turks and Caicos Islands, I would say, as somebody who's watched both. Yeah. Um, however, they do not score goals. They scored across these two legs one goal. It was a penalty. They've only ever scored, including this one, three goals in World Cup qualification in their entire history. All three have been penalties. Wow, have they? Good stat. You've outstatted me there, fair play. I don't know if I have. All three have been penalties. 20 years apart as well, you know, since their most recent sort of goal. So similar to a sort of San Marino time difference uh, in terms of the, the penalty goals. Uh, Luke Paris scoring in this one. In the first leg against Turks and Islands, they also missed a penalty, which is also important to throw out. So penalties, mm -hmm. seemingly their favourite way of scoring goals. The emphasis was always going to be on the Turks and Caicos Islands to win this game by outscoring Anguilla. You had a good attack in Turks and Caicos Islands against an okay defence, and then a poor attack against what I deem to be generally quite a poor defence with the Turks and Caicos Islands, despite a good goalkeeper uh, in Turpeyfield. I'm really disappointed that these games were so low scoring that the Turks and Caicos Islands weren't able to threatened a bit more. They also had a penalty saved in the second leg. Um, really? after they were one nil up and then missed a the penalty um, before the equaliser came, which is gutting. Um, I'm just gutted, man. Really. They, they I, I, just, just yeah, but we, we looked, we didn't know anything about the squad. Turks and Caicos Island seem to be one of the only national teams that basically to have no online or media presence at all. So you don't know what their squad is until they release the lineup five hours before kickoff. And yeah. then in doing so, yeah, <laughs> and then in doing so, basically announced that the under 18s are playing plus Billy Forbes. They've got no, no one, no one. They've got plenty of good players, but they just don't ever play. It's so I'm not going to really go bizarre. full full rant for views. Oh here. no, AFT. Oh, I'm troops not, is AFT, back. These troops is back. I, I've got to say, in a in a Anguilla mm -hmm. deserves to go through because of their football project. Yeah, that's what I think is a fair thing to say. British Virgin Islands are doing it. We, I know we're going to get onto the Virgin Islands derby. You have a, yeah. a number of teams at the real bottom end of the world rankings. And I don't mean that in any disrespectful way. That's just a fact. Who are trying? They're setting up their social media the way, presence. The way you said that then was 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 quite funny. They're trying. No, but they are. No, but they I are actively mate, trying. I get you. I get you they back have there. a social media presence, and Guilla in particular. You know, there's lots of people that we follow on Twitter. You know, surprise shirts are involved with Uprising FC. Gareth's football writings involved. There yeah. are others as well. Um, they are really putting in a lot of effort and trying to make it a thing and trying to and build UK, up a bit of a following. And UK training camps have yeah. tried to, to find potential who, players that yeah, have who can play for them, who have heritage from there. Yeah. 
And and you look at it and you think, fair play. They're giving it a real, real good go and yeah. they're trying. And you've seen the improvement and they deserve it because of this. Yeah, I completely agree, mate. The, the improvement is tangible. You can see it. Yeah. They're making history on the international stage. And and it's so disappointing as somebody who follows Turks and Caicos Science. I was, I will say, on Twitter at two o'clock in the morning, UK time, watching, um, trying to find out how the sort of goals were going in. And I felt like I was the only one not supporting Anguilla. Um, yeah, I think which, you were. Really. Uh, um, yeah. But equally, the fact that I had to go onto Anguilla's Facebook page to find out what was happening in a game in the Turks and Caicos Islands, mm. they, they seem to have no project. They've had three managers in the last year. It's just, it's really not a good time. And, and I think that Turks and Caicos Islands... I love them to pieces. Billy Forbes is really getting on now, and I hope that he does one more World Cup qualification campaign. They are getting close to, in my opinion, probably being the worst team in the world. Yeah, I think so. It's a shame. Uh, it, it is, is a, a real shame. shame. It's a shame, but massive congratulations, as we've said already, to Anguilla. Yeah, uh, for and sure. I cannot wait for them in, in round two. They've got some amazing yeah, pictures man. to look forward to. Um, on to the Virgin Islands derby, which was massive. Um, yeah the first time that these sides had met since this stage at World Cup qualification 14 years ago. I'm pretty certain that those yeah. were the facts. Yeah, yeah. USVI came out on top in that one. That was for 2014 World Cup qualification. They met again, two legs. 1-1 one, one in the first leg. USVI took the lead. Then 98th minute equaliser for the British Virgin Islands. Tom and I were actually travelling back from Stansted Airport at God knows what time following that one. I think it was about half ten and I kept refreshing my Twitter feed as we were sort of approaching home. Um, second leg, US Virgin Islands went down to ten men. Cagey, tense, um, but were able to see it through to penalties and the British Virgin Islands came out on top. An amazing stat that despite progressing, the British Virgin Islands have still never won a single World Cup qualification football match. It is, however, the first time again, similar to Anguilla, that they have ever got past the first round of World Cup qualification. So a massive, massive shout out to their project, what the British Virgin Islands are doing, what they're doing with um, technical director Danny Neville, with champion football, with Chris Kawamia in charge, with the players that they've got that are playing in uh, America, the Caribbean, and in the UK, um, that is bearing fruit, and they still have an incredibly young squad that will only get better. So, I will survive. Just, just quickly, I did think they would actually beat them over the two legs. Yeah. Um, that would be my only caveat. Um, and I was surprised actually because the US Virgin Islands hadn't had a good Nations League campaign, and they'd lost to the Turks and Caicos Islands, hadn't they? I was very surprised, but what I will say is World Cup qualification, you do other players, random players, sort of not random players, but suddenly players that, that haven't represented nations before will will appear and, and, and don the shirt. British Virgin Islands had the Shrewsbury under-21s goalkeeper suddenly that, that was then in, in goal for them, made, making his debut. Um, but no, but I'm, 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 as a BVI fan, I'm really, really pleased uh, that they've made it through and they will now take on Dominica, Domrep, Jamaica and Guatemala. So who do you think has got a better group there, Anguilla or the British Virgin oh. Islands? Uh, Define better. I think the British Virgin Islands will have more, you know, fantastic away days. They're, they're both going to go out. So define better. Anguilla's is easier um, on paper, I think. But I think that BVI will potentially gain sort of more experience. Yeah, I think so. I think what's nice, they've got the game against Dominica as well as a potential yeah. to, to, to get a point or three in, in round two. That would be amazing. A Jamaica away day would be great, wouldn't yeah. it? Jerry yeah. Wiltshire trying to man Mark uh, Mikel Antonio. Antonio. Would be, uh, would be if Wiltshire's coming. fit for it, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, um, he's played second leg and, and they got through, so done well. But yeah, amazing. Sure. So a massive, massive congratulations to both Anguilla and British Virgin Islands for making history this March. Where do you want to go Absolutely. now, mate? Is that is that or is that the perfect end to to this chat? We're over an hour. Dang, we can talk. We can. We'll be. I think after the edits will be just under an hour. Um, okay. Unless we just sort of sit here for the next sort of thirty seconds or so. No. Um, we'll be back uh, with our next 
video that we're going to do. We, we're actually lining up a, a good couple of interviews as well uh, on DNQ. So oh, much- dude, we need to stop throwing out there because we do, and then they fall, they they fall through, and then they don't ever happen, and then we're like, oh. no, no, no. We need to hold ourselves to account for this. Um, but, but we, yeah, yeah, no, fine. Okay. Across April and May, there is uh, loads of content that we're bringing to you, though, and then of course June is the next international break where there's loads of stuff coming up. You've got CAF World Cup qualifiers, AFC World Cup qualifiers, CONCACAF World Cup qualifiers, the actual Euros, OFC Nations Cup, Copper America and the Kenefa World Cup all in June. So if there is no better reason to subscribe than that. So hit that subscribe button. Thanks uh, for being here. Thanks for supporting the channel. And as always, we will see you next time.